How does a knee replacement part really work and who makes it? Growing a body part from your own body, it's called regenerative medicine. The business of medical devices, not making them, buying and selling them. But first, how doctors can check your cardiac rhythms on the cloud. A deep dive into the world of medical devices on this episode of The Language of Business with Greg Stoller. When it comes to medical devices, is it hardware, software, or both? Let's find out from Nancy Briefs. She's the CEO and founder of Infobionic, and welcome to The Language of Business. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. So which is it, hardware or software? Well, actually, you need both. It's both devices and software. And what we've done here at Infobionic is we're trying to leverage the cloud and more powerful algorithms to give better information to cardiologists. When I hear cloud, I immediately think of confidentiality. Why should my cardiac rhythms be on the cloud? Well, today, your cardiac rhythms are at different companies, not necessarily on the cloud, but on different servers. And what we've done is actually the next step in the process, which makes the data very secure. We do not collect personal health information from the practice. The practice just gives us your ID number. So we don't track your social security number, your address, et cetera. And on top of that, in addition to running on Amazon Web Service, we also use a company called Clear Data, which is HIPAA compliant. So a bit of belt and suspenders in that case. Can we see a product demonstration? Yes, I'd love to show you this. This is our system, Momicardia, means monitor me. This is what you would get from your physician, a cardiologist, if you had presented with symptoms of arrhythmia. This is the device, it's small, lightweight, four ounces comes with two batteries, and this is what you would take home from the practice. When the system is turned on, they would program in your name. This is showing Infobionic. Then this actually goes dark. There's no lights, nothing to really interfere. If you have a symptom and you want to record it, you push the button, you get a little white heart, and you know that it's been sent. And it's as simple as that. You wear standard electrodes, so this is worn under your shirt, on your belt, or usually in your pocket. This device has inside it an antenna, a SIM card, and a modem. So the beauty of Momi Cardia is you don't have a two-piece device, which is what all of the competitors in the market has today. So the iPad is going to be used by the cardiologist to read and interpret the data? That's correct. So all of the data in near real time is being sent to our cloud and that information is available to your physician whenever they want to look at it. So what does that mean? They can sign in and what they immediately see are planets so they know if you particularly have had an event, they can go quickly through this. You can see how fast the system works. It pulls up the data. It has all the functionality of a tablet. They could scroll through the information. They could see what your arrhythmia is. And as soon as they've seen what they need to make a diagnosis, they're finished. They can create a report. They can send that report off to the electronic medical system, or they could email it to your private practitioner or anyone that you request. Where is there more innovation, on the hardware or the software side? Well, we're the first company to really think about data and not devices. So I would say that most of the innovation today is in digital health, which is the field we're in. Historically in medical devices, which has been my background for 20, 28 years now, all of the innovation was on the device side. But what we weren't doing is we weren't giving the practitioner or the clinician, in this case the cardiologist, all of the information. We were just giving them snippets. And we believe the future is really going to be around big data and giving all the data when a physician wants it to them. Who do you think your ultimate customer is? Is it the cardiologist or is it their patients? Well, ultimately, the uh, customer for us is the cardiologist because we're not doing a direct-to-consumer. We're doing a clinically diagnostic ECG. And this is used for patients that present with symptoms and want to understand what type of arrhythmia they have. Today, that's a $3 billion market, but more importantly, it drives the therapy market for cardiac rhythm management, which is close to 14 billion. So getting an accurate and timely diagnosis is very important for your physician. Where do you think the medical device industry is going these days in terms of trends? Um, I think as far as the industry trends, what we're seeing is that the innovation today is really being driven by not only the cost efficiency, but the ability to get your technology reimbursed. And 
an example of that for us is that when we built the Momi Cardia platform, we were careful to make it a universal device. Today, there's three different types of monitoring, Holter Event and Mobile. So if you go to a clinic and you open the closet, you would see a plethora of different devices. Nothing talks to each other. So I think in medical devices, you're gonna see companies really thinking about that reimbursement. So both cost efficiency as well as innovation. Talking about innovation, do you think the best exit strategy, either for Infobionic or your personal investments, partnership, sale, or IPO? It's a very good question. Medical devices historically have been, the exits have been 80% acquisition. So we tend to be uh, feeders for some of the large public uh, companies in the space. That said, I, I personally did an IPO with Goldman Sachs in one of mine, and I've done partnerships. But I think the majority of this category is uh, acquisition. Nancy, thank you. Thank you. Nancy Briefs, the CEO and founder of Infobionic. Coming up, growing a body part from your own body. It's called regenerative medicine. The business of medical devices, not making them, buying and selling them. But first, how does a knee replacement part really work and who makes it? Next on The Language of Business. You're watching The Language of Business with Greg Stoller. What happens when your startup becomes large enough that it requires professional management? That's where Bruce Blessington comes in. He has extensive experience managing multi-million dollar medical device companies and welcome to The Language of Business. Thank you, Greg. How do you manage a multi-million dollar company? Well, of course, it depends on the nature of the business. But uh, managing a multinational, multi-million dollar company employs some of the very same principles that one might uh, employ in a smaller business. Start first by hiring and, and motivating the very best people you can get to go to work for you. And then have a clear sense of mission and focus and be sure that that mission and focus is shared throughout the organization. Whether the organization is four or five people or four or five thousand people, it's still the same formula. How does an industry's value chain affect its products, apropos to what you brought? The industry that uh, is represented here uh, is the orthopedic world, and it consists of a handful of large OEMs, names that you would recognize, Stryker, for example, J&J &J Depew, uh, Smith & Nephew. And OEM stands for? Original Equipment Manufacturer, yes. Okay. So these individual companies that are quite substantial global firms retain for themselves the ability to manufacture the most valuable components in the mix. Now this happens to be uh, the femur end of a complete knee replacement and it would, it would fit uh, if you were standing, uh, it would be in this position and if you were uh, if you were, had your knee bent it would rotate sure. uh, in, in like fashion. So the but the fact of the matter is, this by itself doesn't get the job done. It needs to have ancillary materials like this cutting block, for example. The cutting block is not made by the large manufacturers. It's made by a specialist manufacturer who provides the, the entire engineering and uh, manufacturing of this particular component. And, and is this cutting board set for these products? Yes, it's product specific. In fact, each manufacturer uh, has their own set of installation tools and they use this to capture the hospital. They give the tools to the hospital in consideration for the hospitals continuing to use their knee product. Do the orthopedic surgeons need special training per manufacturer or is their training sufficient regardless of the product? Uh, the manufacturers provide uh, training for the surgeon on their product uh, and that is true throughout the industry. Obviously, there are great similarities between the procedures for replacing one knee and another, but there are some finer points that, need to, that definitely need to be part of the instruction of the surgeon. And what can you tell us about spinal? Well, the spine companies are some of the same players that are in the knee space. Uh, however, this particular uh, device is one that would be used to stabilize the spine of a patient who's had a disc fusion and it consists really of rods and pedicle screws. These screws are inserted by the surgeon into the bone structure of the spine and then the rod added and tightened down in a precise location to be sure that the spine is stabilized. You see two sets of rods and screws in this. Is the addition to the screw to give a little bit of give during the surgical procedure? The screw can be inserted 
with quite a high degree of precision by the surgeon, but not sufficient uh, to not require a final adjustment. And the ability of this screw to articulate, as it does, gives the surgeon that freedom. Publicly traded versus privately held, does it matter? Oh yes, it does indeed. Certainly the complexity rises considerably with a publicly traded company, both in terms of the financial reporting requirements, as well as the fact that you are now uh, subject to a great deal of scrutiny, particularly from the analyst community. And here in the United States, of course, we have the dreaded uh, quarterly results meetings in the UK and the EU is uh, half year. So you get a, a bit of a breather. But there's no question, particularly uh, when you're in a period of, of growth or restructuring, that a private company uh, is more advantageous. When it comes to medical device technology, organic growth or growth by acquisition? I'm biased. I like organic growth. Uh, and I think it's, it is a notion that if you invest in my company, you're investing in my company. You're not investing in the prospective acquisition that I have cooking on the back burner. And all too often, growth by acquisition results in a group of non-integrated structures that may not share the same culture, and the results aren't quite as happy as were, as were projected. So the, the most common mistake in acquisitions is not dealing with the cultural aspect, the people aspect, if you will, of the target company. Bruce, thank you. Thank you, Greg. It was a pleasure to be here. Bruce Blessington, a CEO with extensive experience managing multi-million dollar medical device companies. Coming up, the business of medical devices. Not making them, buying and selling them. But first, growing a body part from your own body. It's called regenerative medicine. As the language of business continues, once again, here's Greg Stoller. You have a problem with your car, so you go to the mechanic for replacement parts. But what happens when it's your own body? This might be the answer. We're here on location in Waltham, Massachusetts, along the 128 Technology Belt with Histogenics. John Lieber, CFO, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks for having me. What are orthobiologics and regenerative medicine? So regenerative medicine and orthobiologics are actually a, an umbrella term to, dis, to describe a sector of, of the biotech industry in general. Regenerative medicine is the process of taking a patient's own cells or taking cells from another source and creating them, putting them into, manipulating them, doing things with them to allow them to serve as a personalized individual treatment for that individual. John, can you give us a product demonstration, please? Absolutely. So what you have here is a living piece of articular hyaline cartilage tissue. The way we make the tissue is we take a small biopsy from a non-weight-bearing portion of the patient's knee, about 200 to 400 milligrams of tissue, about the size of a Tic Tac or two. We take that back into our lab. We do a series of cell isolations and extractions put the cells in a 3D collagen matrix, which looks a little bit like this. This is actually the matrix, or what we call the scaffold. We send that into 2D cell culture for about a week of change. It goes into a bioreactor for another week, and then it sits in test tubes basically for another couple weeks after that. And then once that's done, you basically have a living piece of articular hyaline cartilage that's ready to be re-implanted into the patient by the surgeon. So where you would get a cartilage defect, it could first of all happen from repetitive wear and tear, or it can happen from a, an acute traumatic injury. And where you get it is on the ends of the, of the bones that meet in the joints of the knee, and you can get a little divot there, and left untreated, that divot will get larger and larger, because in adults, car cartilage has no innate ability to repair itself. And so what we do is we basically fill that divot in with a living piece of tissue that integrates uh, with the rest of the cartilage in the knee. And what is the recuperation period as opposed to doing nothing or using some other tried and true surgical procedure. So interesting, in our phase three clinical trial, we're comparing to the standard of care, which is called microfracture, which is a surgical procedure where they drill, sub, where they drill holes into the subchondral bone under the divot in the hopes of recruiting mesenchymal stem cells that will basically differentiate into articular hyaline cartilage. It's, an, it's not a bad procedure, but up to 30% of the patients have a re-op within the first couple of years, and the results are very variable. And so what this is designed to do is compare to that. And oftentimes, for example, if you're a swimmer or a runner or a golfer, it may be up to a year before you're doing what you, before you're back on your feet doing what you want to do. In the case of Neocart, which is our product that's in uh, development right now, We've got actually uh, patients who are back to their normal activities uh, as early as uh, five or six months post the surgery. So you're really cutting back almost half the time of recovery. 
Can this be used for other parts of the body moving forward? Good question. So it can, and actually if you can repair cartilage in the knee, you can probably repair it in any other uh, joint in the body. And we make our own scaffolds now, and so by doing that we can make a size that fits the knee, we make a size that fits the elbow, the shoulder, the hip, etc. Do you tend to grow organically or by acquisition, such as in the case of histogenics, Procon? So interestingly, we merged or bought Procon uh, back in 2011. There were some commonality in some of the investors for the companies. There was some addition, there were some synergies that we got by putting the two companies together. They had certain technologies and we had certain technologies. And so in that case, it made sense. Most of, I would say most of our growth will be organic going forward. Although once we get commercial and if we get commercial, our objective would be basically to hopefully combine this product with other products that we could sell through the same commercial channels to the same physicians and patients. From the CFO's perspective, what goes through your mind every day running the company? So a few things. Number one, uh, we got to make sure that we're developing products that are safe and effective uh, for the patients, uh, that we are developing products that will hopefully meet the FDA's approval guidelines, uh, that the company is funded because we're a company that doesn't generate revenues right now, so we're constantly looking to line up our next round of funding. Um, and to make sure that our operations are running efficiently and effectively. And of course, we're also public, so we have public filing uh, requirements that we have with the SEC and other requirements that we have to meet uh, the requirements of being a public company. John, thank you. You're very welcome. John Lieber, the CFO of Histogenics here in Waltham, Massachusetts. Coming up, the business of medical devices, not making them, buying and selling them, when the language of business continues. You're watching The Language of Business. Once again, Greg Stoller. You hear a lot about new medical devices, but do they all work out financially? Bill Edelman is a serial entrepreneur in the space, and welcome to The Language of Business. Thank you. How many medical device companies have you built up and sold? I've built up many medical device companies over my career, but I've sold, I think, five to six of them. And what sorts of returns can an investor expect? Well, it depends entirely on the, on the company itself. It depends on how long they've been in the company. But the rule of thumb for investors, uh, typically when they amortize their returns over time, is about 25% year over year internal rate of return. And that's cash on cash, or is that with debt? No, it's usually cash on cash. And how about the ones that flame out? Well, when they flame out, they're binary, so they go to zero. So the objective is not to let that happen. And how many tend to be successful versus how many didn't make it? Well, it depends on how risky the product is, is how risky the regulatory path is and the nature of the clinical activity that you're attempting to address with the product. So the spectrum could go anywhere from it's a low risk product, but that typically gets a low return to a high risk product with the potential for a high risk return, but that also almost is always binary in terms of its outcome. And how does that compare with other non-medical device companies? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I've been in the medical device field for 36 years, so I'm pretty much fixated on this sector, but it's all over the map. Biotechnology typically has a higher rate of return depending on the stage of the company. Information companies could have a higher rate of return based on, and it could be a shorter duration. Does it matter if the product in question is in favor with the FDA? Uh, no, FDA's whole objective is to provide safety to patients and to really um, make sure that the product preclinical or clinical data supports the indication for use. But FDA doesn't necessarily take a position on whether they are in particular favor of a type of technology. Company sale or IPO? I personally go for company sale. Just because it's easier? Well, because the cost of entering an IPO market could be several million dollars, and that would otherwise be used to operate the company and create greater uh, facts regarding its value uh, in the minds of strategic buyers. So I typically would always opt in favor of uh, an early exit for the benefit of the shareholders versus an IPO. When do you know when the right time to sell us? Well, it depends on a lot of factors. Some of them are, uh, are internal, which relate to how many facts can you create about the company relative to FDA regulatory clearance, maybe international regulatory clearance, so you can commercialize in two separate markets. The ability to initiate and clear intellectual property, which protect the technology, and the clinical need for the product, which may be demonstrated by um, thought leaders or clinicians who use the device. When you're on your third or fourth company, you've had some wins, how much of it is formulaic? It all becomes changes in nouns. All the verbs stay the same. Can you explain that a little bit more? The actions necessary to succeed are usually highly repetitive, especially in how you choose the companies to work with. So it becomes case studies that you rely upon from prior experiences going forward. 
How many people on your management team do you carry with you in three or four? Usually you carry um, a few people with you and, and pro providers of capability such as intellectual property attorneys or corporate counsel, uh, regulatory experts are always critical to have. So I usually bring with me a talent pool that I've, I've worked with and trusted in the past. And how about investors? Investors who are successful with you always want to be associated with you in the future. And do they care that you are always in the same industry? No, they like that. That's where they elect to invest. Hardware versus software, does it matter to you? Well, med medical devices usually don't break down that way. They break down according to whether it's a, a disposable device, which is used once and then discarded, an implant device, which is left inside the patient. Some of these pro companies have hardware associated with them, which have embedded software. But I typically favor a single-use devices or some implant devices. What changes do you see in the industry moving forward? FDA's regulatory oversight is highly variable. In some years, it's quite extensive, very invasive. Other years, it's somewhat hands-off. I expect that FDA will continue to improve their understanding of medical devices and the risks associated with them. And so the evidence that companies need to provide will increase, and therefore the preclinical testing before a product can be brought to market will, will increase. How important is it for these products to have sales outside of the United States? Well, from the perspective of a strategic buyer, um, those, most of those buyers are based in the United States. And so uh, U.S. sales is usually a touchstone. If one of your patents runs out, does it matter to you if the product is selling extremely well? It always matters because a strategic buyer will look at the absence of a patent as a reason to degrade your value. So you need to maintain intellectual property as an asset that can sell alongside of the product. And in that same vein of the companies that you've sold to, have most of them been strategic buyers or financial buyers? All strategic buyers. And why is that? Because they have a commercialization channel that already exists. They have salesmen calling on the doctors who will use the kind of product that we produce. So they are most interested to add to their sales portfolio by taking on the product that we've developed. Do you ever think that you've had too many successes or too, too many years in the business and it's time to stop? Or does that just excite you to keep moving forward? You can always have too many years in the business, but you can never have too many successes. Excellent. Bill, thank you. Pleasure. Bill Edelman, serial entrepreneur in the medical device industry. Thanks for watching The Language of Business, a weekly look at ways to inspire and encourage entrepreneurs. To join the conversation or to watch anytime, go to languageofbusiness.biz.